All right, so the title of the message today will be Lessons from David, Work Your Faith. All right, let's go and let's read it. You know the story, but you know that we're going to go through it again because there's a lot written in those few scriptures about the story of David and Goliath. So let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 4. We're going to read through it first, then I'm going to back up, and we're going to talk about what happened. Same thing we did last week. Champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. You know, many Bibles and many places will teach that that's somewhere between nine and ten feet tall. He was literally considered a giant. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze, weighing 5,000 shekels. Now, that means that on his chest, he was carrying somewhere between 160 to 170 pounds just on his chest armor. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves, and a bronze uh, javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. The iron point itself, the iron tip of his spear was 15 pounds alone. You know, some people will go to the gym and they work out with 15 pounds. No, that was the top of this man's spear. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Verse 8, Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? They didn't even call him Israelites. Aren't you all servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us, okay? So what he said was, big giant man, 9 to 10 feet tall. Israelites on average were about 5 feet tall. Okay, so you're looking at somebody, imagine however tall you are, twice your height, twice your size. Says, okay, I'm going to come and pick a fight with you. If you beat me, my group will serve you. But if I beat you... All of you all are going to have to serve us. Naturally, everybody was afraid of him. Verse 10. Then the Philistines said, this day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. 11 says, on hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Understandably. He was the biggest and baddest that they had, and he wanted to fight against them. What chance did they have? Let's skip to verse 32. I'm not going to read the whole story. We know a lot of it. 32 says, David said to Saul, David's talking to the king, okay? Let no one lose heart on this, let's, let, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man. And he's been a warrior from his youth. He's been fighting longer than you've been alive. 34 said, but David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servants killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. Okay, everyone, there's so much that this little boy just said that has so much meaning that we all can learn from. So I went back and tried to grab as much of it as I could, okay? And what I'll do is, is that I'll talk about the points from David's perspective. Then I'll talk about how we can apply them, okay? All right, here's number one. David acknowledged that God was real. He said that in verse 36, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defiled the armies of the living God. The living God. He didn't say defy the armies of God, a past God, or, you know, our, our figure of God. No, God is alive. And this man has currently defiled them. He's standing up against them. You know, one of the things that the enemy tries to do with us is to question God's existence, or if God is actually, like, alive right now. Has that ever happened? Sometimes things can be so tough, like, man, is is all of this time and effort I'm putting into this faith to serving God, is he even hearing me? Is he even here? You know, you think about how many times you prayed for something and you got something else. How many times you prayed for money and only bills keep coming to your house? 
Okay? How many times have you tried to live right, do the best that you could, and you know the other folks who weren't doing what they were supposed to do look like they're doing better than you? Oh, that hadn't happened to some people in here, right? We all got somebody, people who might not even know God, don't even confess themselves to be Christian, off better than us. And it seems like every time we pray for something, we don't get it. How many times we pray for God to remove that sin from our life, but every time we turn around, we always in it? Mm-mm, got quiet on that one. How many times? Those things will question, or they will cause us to question, because that's what the enemy wants us to do. He wants us to question if God actually exists. But the first point for us is, is that know that you serve a mighty God. Truth is that God is real. That we are here today because of his grace and mercy, and it's his love that actually protects us daily. You know, when we got finished with the, the message last week, uh, Sister Lillian came to me right afterwards, and she reminded me of something that I said a long time ago that I completely forgot about. She had to tell me about four times that I said it before I actually remembered that I did. And some of you all right, might remember this. I said a long time ago, I said that when we pray for something, usually one of two things happens. God is either preparing us for what we pray for or protecting us from that very same thing. Y'all remember that? Some of y'all remember that? Not really? A little bit? So what happens is, is that when you pray for something, God can either begin to prepare you for it or he will protect you from that very same thing. Some of the things that we pray for, we don't need. Some of the things that we pray for are going to do more harm to us than if we didn't have it in the first place. Some of us will pray for money, but know that we'll get more and more in trouble with that money having the same thing that those other folks got than if we had it today. So sometimes he has to prepare us for those things. The thing we have to think about is, is that you have to look at the prayers that God has answered for you. You know God is real because of the things you have asked for, the things that he's done in your life, the trials that you've overcome, and the things that he's brought you out of. And would you say that those great things are by random chance? You just so happened to be in the right place at the right time and the stars, moon, and the sun was aligned in a straight line, pointed right at you, and everything is just great. No, we serve a living God. Don't let your trial tell you differently. Number two, David did. He recognized this as a test, and not just a test. He recognized it as another test. Verse 34, David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off the sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from his mouth. When it turned on me, when it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me, here it is right here, the Lord who rescued me, from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. David had been here before. Now, he hadn't fought Goliath, but he just said right here that he had fought a lion and a bear. Yeah. This particular trial was no different. This was a test of faith. That's all it was. It's been a test of faith all along. Yeah. The lion and the bear, test that he passed with the help of God. Goliath was going to be no different. The purpose in this test was going to be how much he trusted God. It was a test. James 1, 2 says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. The test got increasingly bigger as time went on, but the answer was still the same. The answer was still the same. It was to trust God. Strengthen your resolve. David, even as a boy, had a strong resolve for God because of the lion and the bear. Once the situation with Goliath surfaced, it's no different than any situation that he had already faced and triumphed with before. So, what happens with us? This is the point for us. Realize that your trials are just another test. Exactly the same. How many times do we go through a trial and let it worry us? Every one of them, right? Everything that pops up. How many people are going through something right now? 
How many people are going through something right now? I see some hands. Not everybody going through something. If, it, if it's not here, it's coming. How many people are going through something right now? We got scared hands. We in church. That's what we're doing right here. We're telling the truth. And how many, well, you don't have to raise your hands about this, but how many of you are allowing those trials to worry you? Don't raise your hands. Just think about it. How many of you all think that this might be the big one? Oh, this one's going to take me out. <laughs> it's uh, Sanford. Oh, this is the big one. How many of you all think that this is it? What are some of the things that we worry about? We can worry about our health, right? We have concerns about that. Certain things may pop up. We worry about our health, worry about our job. Oh, they having layoffs over here at our job. I wonder what's going to happen with mine. Oh, the boss doesn't like me. Oh, man, I wonder what's going to happen with that. We worry about bills. What else do we worry about? Somebody in the first service said they worry about kids. Family members, that one came up too. What else? Anything else? What? So what? Bills. What else? School. People worry about school. Anything else? We, we, are we missing some? Business, whatever it is that you do. Our health, right, right? Now, here's the deal. Look back over your life for just a moment. Just think back. How many times have you been delivered from a lion and a bear in your life? How many things has God brought you out of in your life? And just like David said, a young boy figured this out. Why is this situation any different. I've said this one before, too. That throughout your past, out of all the things you've gone through, your success rate of passing all of that has been 100%. You can't get no better because you've come through every single thing that God has tried, I mean, not God, that the enemy has tried to place against you. God has brought you through it. So why is the situation any different? It's a repeat of the same test. Only the circumstances look different. But it's the same thing. Number three, with David. He confessed his victory. Verse 37, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. David didn't say this to himself. He told somebody. He told Saul. He told King Saul that this particular thing will happen. David took the time to openly declare that the Lord would deliver him from this trial. He spoke his victory into existence. You know, we believe being made in the image and likeness of God, the God who spoke the world into existence, that we have the ability to change our circumstances, sometimes by the things that we say. How often do we declare our victories and speak victory over our trials? If I lose this job, I declare I will get another one. My body may look like something is going on right now, but I declare that it's healed. And even if it seems that I have to go to the doctor for something, I declare that that doctor will know where it is in Jesus' name to where I can be healed. You still continue to speak things. Proverbs 18 and 21 says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. So the things that you say can either bring life or they can take it away. Mark 11, verse 23 says, Truly I tell you that if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes what they say will happen, it will be done for them. But the first thing was, if anyone says it, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And even salvation, for you to even come to know Christ, you got to speak it. Romans 10 and 9 says, if you declare with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart. But you got to declare it first. You got to say something. You will be saved. So again, the point to us is, is that we got to learn to speak victory over our life and our circumstances. Again, I ask the question, how much do you speak over your own life? When you wake up and look in the mirror to make sure you're looking right and that you, you got everything that, that the that your shirt is on right, that your tie is fixed, so that the dress is on. You know, what about your spiritual life? You fix that up for the day? You know, oh, you know what? You are a winner today. You are healed today. It will be a great day in the name of Jesus. I am protected. I am covered. 
I'm a child of yours. You speak over your health, your safety, your finances, your relationships, your job. You say those things. Number four. David knew that God had a plan for his life. You've heard this one before. 1 Samuel 16 and 1 tells you that David was, uh, well, let's see here. I've chosen one to be, okay, yeah, basically in this chapter right here, this is where David is anointed to be king. When David comes on the scene, he's anointed to be king. Remember, he was out in, in the fields, and his father had all the best sons of his in the house, well, actually everyone but David, in the house. And Samuel was like, yeah, I think it's one of these guys, but God said, no, this is not it. Find out that it's David. So from a youth, David was anointed king by the man of God, which was basically being anointed by God to say that you have a future. Right? Now, I just went through that quickly, but you know what I'm talking about, right? If not, it's in 1 Samuel chapter 16. Go read. So the thing that they always say is, is that with a purpose given by God, if David is supposed to be king, and you can't be king as a little boy, if he's supposed to be king, then how is Goliath going to kill him right now? David is supposed to be king. God himself said that David was supposed to be king. Now, if that's supposed to happen, then for somebody who defies God that David decides to go up against, why would God not defend him? Why would he not? He's been told he was going to be king. Now, what about for us? God has a plan for you. All right. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Now, this is the Lord. This is not the man of God writing this. This is what the Lord says. Just like before, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. So God has more planned for you than you could imagine better for you than where you are today. And so from a shepherd boy to a king of Israel, David's life underwent a major change. Shepherd boy, not king. But see, God was orchestrating at the same time. You know, you have to learn how to take care of sheep to be able to learn how to take care of a, of a kingdom. That's what God saw. It was a process. God was in control all the time. You want to know if God's plan will sometimes work out when it doesn't seem like it is? Just last week, we talked about somebody who looked like through all that he went through, nothing was going according to plan. From a man who did absolutely nothing. But God was watching the entire time. And for everything that he went through, God elevated him because of that. Second over Egypt, y'all. Second over Egypt. Again, and I know I said this a bunch of times last week, but if you hadn't read the story of Joseph, read that story. Man, that's an awesome story. Okay, so number five, David didn't let others distract him. Now, this one I almost miss. This one I almost miss, but this is just as important as the other ones. Let me see if you guys catch it. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 26. David asked the man standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that should defy the armies of the living God? They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. Now watch this. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, now somebody in the family, heard him speaking with the man, he burned with anger. Why? Oldest brother, jealous of what? He, he, he burned with anger at him and he asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. What? David wasn't even talking to him. And David says right there, verse 29, what have I done? Can I even speak? He then turned away immediately. He turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. He went right on about his business. And the men answered him before. So, with the point of not letting others distract him, how does that happen with us? The deal is, is that sometimes it might be just you and God. All right? Now, people will dislike you sometimes because of the calling you have on your life. Just because of the calling that you have on your life. You also have others who will dislike you because they don't understand 
the calling on your life. There is a difference. And unfortunately, these people might be in the same place, the same church. I would love to think y'all are not in here, but some of y'all may be in the same church or even in the same family. His oldest brother. Joseph, all his brothers sold him into slavery. His own family. Number six. David understood that this was his test. All right, this was another one I almost missed too. Watch this. This is kind of cool. 1 Samuel 17, 38 says, Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. Okay, now stop right there. Here's what happened. Saul says, all right, you're going to go and you're going to represent all the rest of us because you're the only person who seems to be confident enough to beat him. Nobody else wanted to fight Goliath. So Saul says, if you're going to do it, I got to put you in the best of everything. This was the king's armor. You ain't really get no bigger than that. All right, so you got a five-foot boy wearing the armor of the king. You probably couldn't see David. You just saw armor. Just like, like a man just standing there with all of this bronze and all this kind of stuff on there. David couldn't move. He's doing this right here. And he says, what does he say? I cannot go in these because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. That was the point right there. Watch this. Saul wanted to help by giving him the king's best armor. But see, David couldn't use it because it wasn't for him. It wasn't for David. Now, why is that important? Saul tried to help, right? But this was not Saul's test. Saul couldn't put his best on somebody else for a test that wasn't his. David had his own mountain to climb. David had his own giant to defeat, and you can't do it with somebody else helping you. Because you can't rely on that person you got to rely on God because in the event that David beat Goliath wearing Saul's armor, Saul could say, oh, well, it's because he had the best of the king's armor on him. Oh, with the help of Saul, he was able to do it. Couldn't do it. Now, how does that apply to us? There is one answer for every trial in life. Rely on God. Because this way, if Somebody else's armor doesn't fit you. You have no choice but to trust on God. You can have others to try and help you through that trial. They can only help you so much because, again, our God's a living God. And our trials are specific for us. So they can only walk with you so far because this is your trial. They got their own trials they got to go through. The same way you can't help them with theirs, they can't help you with yours. So when the victory comes, if all you've been doing is relying on God, there is no question where your help came from. Notice I know where my help comes from. It wasn't from that person over there. It wasn't from this one. And it wasn't from Saul giving me his armor. It was God. Number seven, we almost there. David's faith allowed him to be victorious. Verse 45, and just think about all of this right here. Just as you read it, just really think about what's going on here. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord God Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day, watch this, this day that the Lord will deliver you into my hands. Now, this is a little boy, right? You know, um, you, you, I know you all have seen it. You ever seen sometimes you'll be out in these kids and they just all disrespectful, right? Just saying anything to an adult. That's what's going on right here. You got a kid saying this right here, this day the Lord going to give you to me. He's saying this to a grown up. But there's a difference, though, because Goliath is now coming against the God that we serve. And he's asking for a fight. David telling him, you want to fight, I'm going to give you one. But before we fight, I'm going to tell you already what's going to happen. That this day, God is going to deliver you into my hands. Keep going. And I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day, meaning that day, meaning today, meaning right now, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. 
All those gathered here, will, gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands, all of you. Now, this is where it gets big, right? Okay. Verse 48 says, as the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran. Stop. Usually, if you call somebody's bluff, they're going to run, right? They're going to run. They're going to do something. They're usually not going to stay in there. He, David went one direction, but it wasn't away from the fight. As the Philistine moved, David charged the battlefield right towards his opponent. Imagine the faith you have, because now this is the moment of truth. Can your faith really back up all that you've been saying all of this time? David ran right at him to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it. Struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. Okay, now another thing before too, and Bishop's talked about this and I, I looked it up as well. All right, so Goliath had this huge armor on, right? All of this stuff just covered him. You know, I talked about a helmet that he had on earlier and everything. Now, the helmets that they wore back then didn't come to like this. They didn't just wear it on top of their heads like a hat. It covered their face. All right. Now, the way it would cover their face is it would cover their face like this. All right. So the only exposure that you had was about this big for their eyes so they could see. So David, at a man twice his size, on the first rock, the first stone, hit him square in his eyes, which sunk right into his forehead in that little bitty hole for the helmet. That would have meant that he had sniper precision yeah. with his first, <laughs> with his first rock, the very first one. And verse 50 says, so David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling, a stone without a sword in his hand. He struck down the Philistine and killed him. David defied, David defied all odds. Almost 10-foot champion couldn't stand up to a little boy with God on his side. You can triumph over your circumstances in the very same way. The very same way. How does this apply to all of us? You have to unleash your faith in the middle of your trial. There's, a, there's an L missing off of there. But yeah, in the middle of your trial, know that God is in control. Know that for everything that comes up against you, God has already given you what you need to throw your own stones at those giants. Amen. And actually, all you need is one. Stone of faith. It's the title of the message, work your faith. That's all you need. You rely on God and work your faith. Now, here, here's something else that, that I was, that I saw, and this is, it's not really an eighth point. I think I kind of had it like that in my notes, but I was just thinking... Um, well, no, 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 I'm sorry. Let me back up real quick. This is a question that I had. This is a question that I have. All right, so we know, for those who know the story, all right, we know that Saul tried to put his armor on David, right? Didn't fit, right? David took it off. David went to the brook, and he picked up what? He picked up the stone, right? Just said, okay. How many did he get? Five. He grabbed five stones. Well, yeah, okay, all right. I, I, I get that, all right? Somebody, she said grace. Five is a number for grace, okay? But David only needed one. He only needed the first one. So why did God lead him to pick up four more? Okay, I hear you on the grace thing. Okay, I, I get that. But I was just thinking to myself, like, you know, what are the possibilities for that? The scripture doesn't say, so it leaves us to interpret it. Now, I have a theory. And, you know, that's just me. A lot of people may not even think of that. He just, oh, he picked up five. He just needed the first one. Boom. He's, you know, he's good. All right. But I'm just wondering, like, if everything in the Bible is significant, then why did he pick up five? So here's what I thought. From a spiritual plane, yes, the number five does mean grace. Okay. But I feel like there's more to that. In the story, what we have here is, is that, yes, he picked up five. But it's almost like God was sending a message to the enemy, to Satan at that time, to say, he got five, but I only needed one to take out your best. Amen. Now, for anybody else who want to act crazy, 
I got four more. And now granted, it's four stones, but for all the Philistines watching this fight right here, they very best was knocked out in the only spot that you could get to his forehead, which is one. So, which means to me that God was kind of sending the message to Satan that we're not just prepared for you. We're over-prepared for you. So for anything else you want to try, we are already ready for it. So, how does that apply to us? This is number eight here. With God, you won't just win, you'll dominate. So you think about the things, again, with your past rate of success being 100%, how much of that stuff going to grab you again? How much of that stuff have you truly overcome, meaning that not only did you just, you didn't just skate through that thing, like, oh, it just made it through by the skin of my teeth. No, God brought you out of that thing in a mighty way. Or did he not? He brought you through that stuff in a mighty way. So it's a message to say that you can try this stuff again if you want to but we got more waiting on you, okay? So, got a little exercise that we want to do. If, um, if you're in the seat, stay in the seat for a minute. This is going to be pretty short. If you're not in the seat, you can get in the seat because we're going to lower the lights, okay? I mean, if you don't want to, you can stay in there. That's fine, but let's just not walk around for a minute. Let's lower these lights out here just for a minute. I got something that... I want you all to do. This is a a way of meditating and seeing your victory come to pass, all right? Everybody close your eyes for a minute. Maybe just a couple minutes. Just close your eyes, close your eyes. Now, like I said, now, for those of you all who are going through a trial, this is for you. For those who said you weren't going through something, just hang on for a second. Now, you and God know what your issue is. For those of you in the overflow room, sorry, we can't get the lights down in there, but you guys can close your, your eyes too. All right. You know what's going on in your life. You know where the enemy is trying you. You know where the enemy is testing you. You know, and he may be coming at you from a couple of different places, but you know where that giant is in your life. I want you to imagine that giant. And no, we are not talking about individual people. We are looking at this from a spiritual standpoint. If you see somebody, a person's face in your head, get it out. (laughs) Because we're not throwing rocks at people, okay? (laughs) Spiritually, see that giant in your mind. You are David right now. Imagine the battlefield. You are surrounded by Israelites, by Philistines. In front of you is Goliath and giant. Behind him are all the Philistines. Too many to count. But behind you were all the Israelites. They're not on the battlefield. But something is on the battlefield beside you, and it's the presence of God. It's the presence of God wrapping you up. You feel his hand on you. You feel his presence on you. Almost to a point where you're glowing. Because your faith is that strong. This giant is looking at you. This giant of debt, this giant of sickness, this giant of your job. He's looking at you. Oh, this is going to take you out. Oh, this is the big one. Oh, this is it. But you reach into your pocket. You got five stones in there, but you just need one. You grab the first one that comes to your hand. That first one has something inscribed on the front of it. Five letters, F-A-I-T-H, faith. Your first stone is a stone of faith. Your trial begins to walk towards you but now armed, now with the presence of God on your side, you rush to the front of the field. You pull out that stone, you move that sling. You've done this so many times before. You sling this stone just like it's another word of faith. I will overcome you. I will overcome you. That stone flies and it smashes that giant right in the forehead. And you watch as that mountain of whatever it is, whatever tried to come against you, fall right in front of you, lay itself prostrate at your feet, dead. 
with the help of God, you have just now destroyed that giant. And everything else that will try to come against you behind is now terrified of you. Imagine the Philistines now terrified of David. The Israelites were terrified of the Goliath, but now you had a young boy. You now have destroyed that giant. So the next time it comes, as you open your eyes, the next time that trial tries to come up in your life, I made this graphic right here. It says to keep calm and release. Release that faith that you're holding on to. Throw it at your giant.